is drowned in the storm What high what depths it means When fears are still, when striving seems My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day From the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse is lost, it's great upon me For I This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of men
Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Walnut Creek Baptist Church. We're glad to have all of you here on this Sunday morning in late July. Looking forward to a great service, beautiful weather outside, and we pray that today's service will be a blessing to you, both those here and also those watching online. Let's all stand together, and we'll open up with one of our favorite songs on here, The Lord is My Salvation. All right, good morning, church family. Good to see everyone here this morning. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 2 tells us this, that the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So let's join together in worship this morning as we sing, The Lord is my salvation.
Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful song to start out. The Lord is my salvation. Thank you for coming. Let's open in a word of prayer. Can we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the truths that we can sing and praise and worshiping you. The Lord is my salvation. Let us not depend upon our deliverance from anything else. The ways of this world, the culture, our own ingenuity, our own craftiness, but the Lord, specifically the Lord Jesus Christ, is our salvation. Lord, I do pray for this service that you would be glorified and honored in everything. Thank you for those that are visiting. Thank you for those who are watching, maybe for the first time. I pray, Lord, you would just use this service to strengthen our faith for those who know Christ as their Savior, to bring that one that's nearest hell this morning for salvation. We thank you for all that you're doing. Ask that you guide, direct, and bless this entire service. In Christ's name I pray, amen. About 10 years ago, I heard this song for the first time, and I said, man, what a wonderful song. And I know this brings tears to some of your eyes. It has a specific meaning about how God will get us through very difficult times. And I believe it's a song that we can sing today with boldness and clarity. He will hold me fast. Jude 24 and 25 tells us this. <clears throat> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. As we continue our worship service this morning, join us as we sing, He Will Hold Me Fast.
Amen. It was great singing. Thank you. You could be seated. Well, good morning, church family. Um, we have lots going on. Uh, coming up this week, uh, I believe the bulletin that you had attached to the Friday update said that Kids Camp was on Wednesday. It is indeed on Tuesday. That was a mistake. It will be this Tuesday from 9 to 11.30, so if you uh, want to bring your kids to that, if you could maybe just give Beth Fox, like if you are if you have been coming and you're not going to make it or things like that, especially for the larger families, that would be appreciated. Uh, next Sunday, the 31st, we will have the Lord's Table at both services, so plan for that. And then we will resume our midweek ministries this week. Uh, we will have Smiley's Ice Cream, ice cream Truck here again uh, at 8 o'clock. And then we will have a Teen Creek Night. We will have the uh, youth group from Mill Creek Community Church join us here at the church. Uh, on the 29th at 6 p.m. for Water Wars. The cost is $10. That covers um, dinner and snacks and drinks. If you are able, um, in years past, we've always asked our families if they are able to bring like a cooler or something with filled water balloons to help us out with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Please sign up on the app so we know how many to expect. Our Awana registration is live on both the website and the app. We do ask our church family if you could sign up on the app um, and then advise your friends, neighbors, uh, people you know to use the website. It is going to be a little bit more um, as far as cost for non-family, uh, church family members. And then finally, we uh, just got back on Friday night from um, Camp Kobiak. It kind of feels like a blur. I was here last Sunday and then a lot of stuff happened there. Now I'm here again. Um, but it was a fantastic camp. We were greatly impressed. Michigan did not disappoint with their weather. Um, it was a beautiful week. The speakers were fantastic. Our kids had a great time. We took a great group of kids. Um, we had uh, one that made a um, decision for salvation, which is a huge praise, and uh, others that, um, you know, just as, as camp typically does, will be changing um, certain things in their life and we just hope that as a youth group and as a church we can be praying for them to continue that um, far beyond this week and then we have a video to show um, of our teen camp there will be a junior video I believe at the end of the service and we will have some of our junior campers here for the second service to give some testimonies thank you
must empty ourselves, watch now, of the flesh so that you and I can be full of the Spirit. The more that you're around your Abba Father, the more you are going to be like Him. Who's going to be the one that stands up and says, Yes, here am I, Lord, send me. Yes, here am I, God. I'll be that man. I'll be that woman. No matter what my school says, no matter what happens in the house, no matter what all my friends are doing, I'm going to be the energetic. I'm asking. This week is the Booty! Time is now. Well, not for the faint of heart, no doubt about that. And I'm watching that, and I said, I'd like to do that, that, and that, but I'd probably get hurt doing all those things. So uh, anyway, and it's amazing that they do all of that and actually come back and... Uh, there's no injury so we'll see but gentlemen come forward if you would as you get older you start to be more of a safety officer and appreciate your faithfulness and giving we'll have a couple testimonies in the 11 o'clock service for those that uh, be some seniors and at the end I want you to watch the junior campers we had a number of people went we took three vehicles and they were jammed wall-to-wall -wall and treetop tall everyone was filled we had two vans uh, two vans and a, a Jeep that, that took all to camp. So we're excited about that. I appreciate you giving because, as I said last week, if it wasn't for the subsidy of our fundraising, primarily by church people, those that went, the cost had been over $500 per camper. And uh, so we're going to work on how we can do that better and allow uh, some more um, skin in the game by not just our people that go, but also others outside the church as well. And we're looking forward to next year's camping season. Uh, and it was our first time there, very much wilds-ish, a little, some things are a little different, but I tell you, it was exactly like the wilds, maybe even better in some areas. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, continuing to go to Michigan as the Lord allows in the future. But God is so good, and we thank the Lord. I want to ask you to be committed to giving unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had our offerings have maintained themselves over the last couple of months. Be a tither by conviction. You got your quarterly report out, and I want you to look at that and look on where you stand in the area of not just giving, but spiritual maturity. And part of it all comes from the heart. Our church doesn't need anybody's money. We do not need a penny from, if, from you. It's all from the Lord, and uh, you, you graciously have been giving to our church, and we thank the Lord for it. Most of you give online or through our app. Many of you give here in the offering as well, and we thank the Lord for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to ask my good friend, Brother Kirk Kelly, if you could come up and pray for the offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house this morning. Amen. And Lord, as we 
come to the time in the service where we worship you through giving. We just uh, pray that you would multiply and increase the offering, that it would be used for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we pray that you bless both the gift and the giver. And uh, Lord, we also pray that you'd prepare our hearts for the message that pastor will be delivering. Pray that we'll be receptive. And uh, Lord, we just pray that everything that's said and done here this morning will bring honor and glory to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, church family, as we conclude this portion of our worship service this morning, let's stand please together as we sing one of the great hymns of the faith, How Great Thou Art. So join us and lift your voice. My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. That God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Wonderful singing. Uh, would you grab your Bibles at this time as I ask our worship team to step down? And Josh is coming to read our scripture for this morning. All right, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter number 37. Psalm chapter 37, we'll be reading here through the first 11 verses here this morning. Psalm chapter 37, and starting in verse 1, the Word of God says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, 
over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Thank you. You may be seated as Pastor brings the message. So much going on this summer in our church, and I'd be, um, it wouldn't be right not to recognize a lot that's happening before we get into the message with our kids' camp. With, uh, of course, the we had about 115 children in our um, VBS. Looks like we'll have 70 plus in Awana, and all of our uh, C groups, including our college classes, doing well. Teens are doing well. And I want to thank um, personally all of those who work in those ministries of helping and allowing us to get the gospel out into our community as we want to be a disciple-making church, disciples-making disciples, not a church that just meets and uh, gathers information or information transfer from the pulpit and then you leave and information transfer, information transfer, but really dealing with the issues of the day, and that's what this message is about, dealing with people and uh, in relationships and disciple making in our community. No doubt about that, that's what God would have us to do. And uh, not to take away from the uh, importance of preaching, but you need to be able to take what is preached here and be able to go out there. And uh, we, I know we're doing a great job at that and looking forward to a great, great year. We're in Psalm chapter number 37. The subject matter today is something that we all struggle with. I struggle with it, you struggle with it. It seems like our side is losing. And every day that goes by, there's another you know, incredible thing that happens in culture and society. Another church that goes apostate that starts believing in, and especially in the area of sexuality, which has been thro totally thrown out the window when it comes to biblical truth. We see it's all imploding around us. We see the gospel is kind of hidden even amongst Christians today because we're almost afraid to declare what God would have us to declare. And it seems like there's no end in sight. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we're exactly where God wants us to be? If you believe in the sovereignty of God, the providential nature of what happens, then we're right where we need to be. No, we don't agree what's going on. We know we have to stand up for truth. But really, everybody look here, it's not up to us. We're not the Savior. God uses us to get the gospel out. God uses us to see men and women, boys and girls, come to know Christ. We have several more and be baptized in the next couple of weeks. Praise the Lord for that, that we have been able to reach some people in that area. But if we're not careful, the church of Jesus Christ will be nothing more than moaning and complaining about how bad things are. And I want to tell you, that resonates nowhere. I don't find that in the gospel, and it sure doesn't resonate out here. And what we find today is some encouraging news which I believe was written, possibly penned by David. We believe that. And things aren't going real well. There's a whole reason to be negative. But where is Christ? And what he's saying here, by the way, when you look at the Bible, you look especially at what Paul wrote uh, to Timothy, evil men and seducers will wax or grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Guess what? It doesn't say in the Bible things are going to get better. It says in the Bible, if we use this for all our faith and practice, is that it's going to get worse. We're not going to usher in the millennial kingdom with some glorious Christian nation. It may be that we're hiding in the homes and in the flats and struggling just to have a Bible study, as they do in many countries around the world. And what this message today is, we're not to fret, or we're, why are we fretting with the prosperity of the wicked? Another application of this message could be things are going really bad for you, and somebody who's not serving the Lord, they're not doing what they should be doing. It seems like things are going great. 
age-old question is, why do bad things happen to good people? I think we can look at this today and hopefully we can get some encouraging news to all of us to press on. I get excited when I see young people. I get excited when I see college people. I get excited when I see people that are reading the Bible, studying, and going to groups, and, and getting right with God. Because that's so counter to what they're being told. We can light a candle to curse the darkness. I think we need to do a little of both, but sometimes we curse the darkness so much when we do light the candle, nobody pays attention to it. Think about that for a moment. We find in this text something, fret not yourself in verse number one. That word fret comes from a Hebrew word. It really means don't get angry. Don't worry. We use fret as worry, but really the, the text of that and the, the, the languages, I think, bear me out. It's not to worry about it. Don't get angry about it. Don't be envious of wrongdoers, it says. Because in verse number two, it says they fade like the grass, kind of like our grass has done the last couple of weeks. Praise God for no rain. I hate mowing grass. And else like that besides me? I can't stand it. My wife says all the time, we need the rain. I can't stand rain. It only rains 190 days a year here. I can take a few days with no rain, right? I know our yard crews, the volunteers that mow the 10 acres here, they really liked it because I think they either get a week off sometimes in the summer because of the fading like the grass and then he says in verse number three trust we'll talk about that in a minute and verse number four he says delight i love the end of verse number three i just want to jump ahead a little bit in verse number three he says trust in the lord and do good draw in the land and befriend the faithfulness in other words feed on the pasture god has given you and it's a safe pasture and eat it up verse number five is commit yourself to the lord Verse number six, he talks about the light of righteousness. Verse number seven, which we'll talk about at the end of this message, be still. How many of you have a problem with being ADD anxious or not being still? Raise your hand. Da 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 da, right? Chill out. As one young person said to me not that long ago, take a chill pill, Pastor. Be still and wait before the Lord and wait patiently for him. We find in verse number 9, he says, wait for the Lord as well. Verse number 10, I love this, in a little while the wicked will be no more. So we see in our text, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I think a cross-reference to that New Testament is Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Don't get angry with him. Over the man who carries out evil devices. And then I love verse number 10. In a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. I like to preach a message I've titled this morning, dealing with prosperity of the wicked let's pray together can we do that dear heavenly father we thank you for this wonderful psalm we thank you for the book of psalms what a blessing it is to do to have the summer in the psalms in this church this time of year and lord i pray you would fill me with the spirit give me wisdom as i preach Allow this message to fall on ground that has been plowed and ready to receive it. Lord, I pray that we will put aside all the anxiety, all that dro troubles us, and allow us to soak in God's word. Lord, let us be a light in a dark world. Help us to understand the difference between cursing the darkness and lighting a candle. Lord, guide and direct as only you can. 
and we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I often said to my children growing up, life is not fair. And that kind of comes across as caustic and it is not fair. And life is not going to be fair. And if you think that's true, you're in for a world of hurt. You might be saying to yourself, I'm doing everything right and look at them. They prosper while I suffer. Dealing with prosperity, the wicked. David wrote this in his old age, this psalm. It deals with a problem that has puzzled maybe people for thousands of years and throughout all the ages. How do I account for the fact that the lawless are often prospering and the godly often face the greatest hardships? How is that? Well, we take away the Holy Spirit, we take away God, and we look at the flesh. There's, there's a reason to believe that. I mean, that, that would get all, it's all discouraging. How about the Christians right now that are jailed in Cuba that recently had a Bible study, and they're going to be, you'll never hear from them again. Are they not part of the brothers and sisters in Christ? Do, do they not, they're not able to meet today? Where do they line up in this prosperity Christianity mantra? How about a Christian that's fired for failing to lie about a sales pitch at his company and he just lost his job for not failing to lie? How about a Christian baker that was persecuted for failing to sell a wedding cake to a gay couple and yet he lost his entire business, was bankrupted in defending that in court? How about a pornography empire that makes millions and millions, billions of dollars of smut and sin? And while they seem to be prospering, the Christians suffer. I mean, I can go on and on and on and give you example after example. But Christianity... The historical Christianity, the faith that we have inherited, the faith that we find in the Bible, was never built on prosperity, ever. In fact, if you look through the, the time that Christianity has been the strongest, especially evangel evangelization, has been when the church has been persecuted. The lack of persecution will drive the Christianity to Mediocrity, complaining, preferences, and nothingness other than us four and no more. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. The faith can definitely be built on trials. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, Paul was saying, because I saw so much, because God allowed me to see the revelation directly from God, I will pen a large portion of the New Testament. I will be the author of that. He says, to keep me from getting a big head. A thorn was given to me in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me. The King James says it this way. I love it. To buffet me. To keep me from becoming conceited. And he said three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it, I should leave me. But he said to me, most of you know this verse, my grace is sufficient for what? Thee. My strength is or my power is made perfect in weakness. I would therefore boast all more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, calamities, and I love this as I close this portion of the text. For when, for the sake of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. Do you get it? Just maybe the very thing we're aggravated with is what God is using to strengthen our faith. Oh, so much more. Historic Christianity is built not on prosperity, but our faith. Our faith is strengthened when, in Christ during difficult situations. By the way, this doesn't mean that God doesn't bless obedience. Yes, he does. This doesn't mean that blessings will come our way. Oh, they will. What it does mean that God will use our trials and circumstances, look here, please don't miss this, to glorify him. Sometimes we have to wait. Waiting on the Lord. I struggle with that. When I used to drive to, from South Jersey into Philadelphia to work for those 
decade or so, I had to drive over the Walt Whitman Bridge, Ben Franklin Bridge, Tacote Mapire, Palmyra Bridge, if you know Philadelphia. There are three different bridges, and I started jockeying for position 15 miles away from finding out which bridge had the less traffic. And I would, you know, move this, move that. I might save one minute in getting to work. Where are you? What's bothering you? What is aggravating you? Just maybe it's not that important. He's, you know, waiting. It's about setting aside your own abilities and skills and activity to trust God, his abilities and skills. And it's about timing. God's timing, not yours. Waiting on the Lord is a sum of depending upon God and subjecting our will to his terms and timing. Waiting includes patience, as we find in James chapter 1, verse number 4. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, wanting or lacking nothing. Waiting. Offered our ability to trust God and wait on Him, and His confidence is tied to our willingness to set aside our own agenda, skills, and abilities, and ingenuity. Here's what some of us think about waiting, and I'm kind of in this crowd. We think waiting on the Lord is like waiting in a long line at Cedar Point. You ever been to Cedar Point besides me? Raise your hand, you've been to Cedar Point. The lines are incredible. I didn't go anymore because the lines are so long. And then if they can't extort more money out of you, they'll give you a pass where you can jump to the front of the line to pay more money to go. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? To wait on long lines so you can go on a roller coaster that throws you upside down, that puts G-forces against your heart and your stomach that may make you pass out. Please let me have more of that. I have so much I could say about that. But, but it's not like waiting on God is not like, like waiting in a long line in an amusement park. We aren't waiting around with nothing to do. We think waiting on God is sitting there. Oh, God, just I'm waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. No, waiting on the Lord is like, I heard this illustration. It's pretty, pretty good. It's like a high-class waiter who watches to see the needs and the direction of the people of the table he serves. We actively serve God and attune ourselves to him when we patiently wait for him to accomplish his plans. We're still serving but we're waiting on God. Psalm 123, 2 puts it this way. Behold, the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, the eyes of the maidservant to the hand of their mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord, our God, to his mercy is upon us. So an encouraging note. If you have your Bibles in Psalm 37, I want to show you a couple of things. Verse number two. I love it. By the way, I was asked today, I would ask, do you believe the Bible's true? Everybody's going to raise their hand. He's going to say, no, I'm a skeptic. I came here to, you know, I don't think that we're going to say the Bible's true. We believe the Bible's inspired. All scriptures given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We believe that the Bible is inspired. It's directly from God, God's word, without error, inerrant. The Baptist 2000 Baptist Faith and Message, which the BRNSBC asked us to, to, to agree to before we would partner with them, said we must agree to the inspiration of the Bible or you cannot be a part of this group. So we believe inspiration is important. Everybody would wave their hand and say, yes, I believe that. Well, if that's true, look at verse number two. Guess what? They're going to lose. <laughs> Simple, right? Look what it says. For they will soon fade away like the grass and wither like a green herb. We know the end and they're not going to win. Now, I can say that, and that may go in one ear and out the other, but it's true. We find in Psalm 37, look at verse number 9. For evildoers shall be cut off. Verse number 10, and just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Now, the key is the little while. Well, I says, well, Pastor, what is a little while? How long is that? I don't know. But I do know that it says it's not going to end well for them. In my devotions, I'm going through Jeremiah, a great book. 
I would ask all of you to have a devotional plan. This September, we're going to kind of give churches, uh, give church, give people in our church a little plan how to read the Bible, read it, be able to write things down. You can go decades, but I want to tell you, if you're not journaling every morning, you're not writing things down, you're missing a lot of the blessings. In Jeremiah, you read about how Babylon was used by God to discipline Israel but when you get to Jeremiah chapter 50 51 and 52 it doesn't end well for them the Babylonians and what I find here it says in a little while there will be no more so where are we the big idea this morning I said all of that is leading into the message because you're in the first service you get the shortened version of this but anyway it says trusting in God and his timing Look at here. Settles everything. I love not having a cordless mic because I can do this. <laughs> Number one, dealing with the prosperity of the wicked means we must trust and delight in the Lord. So much there. Fret not yourself because of evildoers be not envious of wrongdoers fret don't be angry or anxious that takes prayer doesn't it be not envious of wrongdoers do we envy the secularist in the Hollywood crowd is that what we really want to be seriously are we envious of the wrongdoers that are getting away with it? And then verse number two, look at their future. For they soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Verse number three, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. And then I love the last part of this, dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Befriend. One commentator said this about this verse. Feed on it and find safe pasture with God. And then we have this verse that sometimes we take a little bit out of context. Delight yourself in the Lord and he's going to give you everything you want. No, it doesn't say that. Oh, he'll give you what you... No, 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 no. I'll kind of proof text this in a minute. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all these things, your stuff, your needs, your desires, shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first. Trust and delight. Trust there means confident and unsuspecting. The delight there could be looked at this way, to re refresh oneself or to pamper, make softer in joy, trust, delight in God. Enjoy. So much of the Christian life is bearing it. Does your face and your actions actually reveal anything that God has done anything in your life? Yes, we've all had bad days. How many of you have people around you that knows when things aren't going well and they say, what's wrong? How many of you, my wife says, what's wrong? Because she can look at me. You see that, that kind of scrowling, angry face. I'm not saying we're supposed to walk around all the time with joy, but I really wonder, do people want to hear what we have to say by the way we act and the way we treat Christianity and our God, sometimes the way we treat other Christians. Fret means to become angry or excited. Don't fret. The desires really means what is lawfully right and good. The psalmist says in 84.11, For the Lord is good and a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he behold. Now the key is, we can stop there, and it sounds like the health and wealth gospel, from those who walk uprightly. Trust. 
my wife and I had the privilege, her family has a huge family reunion. There were like 70 of them there, maybe more, I don't know. There were 110 if they had them all, some were able to come. And it was down at the Fontana Dam in North Carolina. It's in the middle of nowhere. Go to the middle of nowhere and then travel another 100 miles, and that's where it is. I mean, it's literally, there's no cell service, praise the Lord, only in the place we stayed. Everybody would huddle around the, the area to get their text messages and emails in the morning. And that was it, because when you went out, there's nothing out there. I mean, you could walk and, you know, this is where people hide from the law, I guess. And it, it, I don't know. I mean. In fact, I was taking a hike by myself, and I was going up. No, Ann and I, Ann, you were with me. We were taking a hike, and we were, I mean, we were out in nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. And we, we stumbled upon the end of this road. And I said, well, let's keep going. Oh, I'm just not sure about this. And, you know, there's, I guess there's coyotes and bears, all kind of stuff there. It's in the, the hills of the Smokies. And we go about another quarter mile, maybe not quite that far, maybe two-tenths of a mile, and we see this big trap. I never saw trappers. And you know what it said? It said, um... What do you call a wild hog? A boar trap. And it goes, if there's one of those puppies around here, we're done. So we need to leave. But we're in the middle of nowhere. So we walked back across this dam. And this dam is hundreds of feet high. It was built during the Great Depression, after World War, uh, during World War II and the Great Depression. And it's literally, you know, you look straight down. I had a level of trust. When I walked over that dam, that dam was not going to fail, even though it was leaking everywhere. I'm looking, shh, shh, that guy's fixing it and patching it everywhere. But I knew that that dam wasn't going to fail because I had trust in that. I trusted the dam. Two to three hundred feet above the river dam. Will the dam hold or will I fall? By the way, when you trust the Lord, it changes your perspective on everything. I walked around with confidence that I would get to the other side. We were on the top of the dam, by the way. So I want to say... And our first point, you must trust God. You must give it to Him. There's a point that you need to do that. Number two, dealing with prosperity of the wicked means, and this is key, we must, now that word commit's an interesting word. We're going to talk about that. We must commit ourselves to the Lord. Commit. Commit ourselves to the Lord. We must be willing to do that. Now the word commit comes from the Greek, I mean, from the, from the, the languages, means to roll or to roll away. In other words, you roll it all onto God. I'm committing myself to God. You must commit yourself to the Lord. You must get knee deep in the things of God and give it to Him. Commit to roll away or to roll the weight to Him. Let God act on your behalf. And then let me just where it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. You've got to step in and go. And when bad things are happening to you, and not everybody else is being successful, when our culture, which you can't make this up, gets further and further and further, don't be surprised. If you believe in a sovereign God who created the world, who made something from nothing, if you believe, do you not know that He knows what's happening? Does it mean we like it? Does it mean we don't preach against it? But sometimes I wonder, does God really know? To roll away. Let God act on your behalf. Then he says in verse number 6, He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. We are to be lights. And your justice as the noonday, the vision of the future. The vision of the future of Christianity. Just maybe God is allowing certain cultural things to happen so we will shine brighter. Not hiding in a cave and saying, Come quickly, Lord Jesus, please come. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, casting all your care upon him before he cares for you. Could be that you've been misquoted, falsely accused, or slandered. I know that's never happened to you, but it happens to me occasionally. Especially when I say something online, I go, did I really say that? I got all aggravated. Somebody was tweeting some things about me in our church about two or three months ago. It was really pretty ugly. People don't even know me. I think some of you got wind of it and said, Pastor, you're seeing what they're saying about our church and stuff. I says, this really, I said, none of that was true, not a single thing. I says, you know, let it go. 
By the way, your friends don't need to hear it, and your enemies won't believe it anyway. Commit your means to commit the entire matter to God. Roll the whole weight on Him. Let Him act on your behalf. Let Him be your vindication. It will become clear for all to see you are innocent after all. Barnes, Dr. Barnes says, if your slander, if your character is assailed, if it seems for a time you're under a cloud of reproach and it comes upon you from devices of wicked men in such a way you cannot meet it, then you will commit to the case of God. He'll protect your character. He will cause the clouds to disperse in his time. And all may be clear in a reference of character and the motives of your contact to some will be without a cloud, end quote, Dr. Barnes. So you've got to commit yourself to God, this culture, this society, and we need to understand it takes a commitment to roll it over. Let me give you an example. Those of you who get a little older, around 52 to 55, maybe up to 60, you have, if you've had any savings, you've had a 401k, a 403b, which we have here, or you have some type of retirement, or if you're changing jobs, they'll say, we'll take your, um, save your, four, let's say, 401k, they'll take your 401k and you can what? Roll it over, right? You ever heard that term? Roll it over into whatever the other guy's 401k is, whatever it is. And that rollover means that you are trusting that person with your possessions, your savings, what you've saved, and you're rolling it over to them. It's called a rollover. And you give it to them, hopefully, because they have experience. You give it to them because they know where to invest, which right now means nowhere. <laughs> you give it to them because they're trained. You give it to them because in retirement, they might manage your cash flow between Social Security and what you have left. And you don't run out of money. They tell you what you can spend every month. And this is in many ways a proper analogy. When you roll it over to God, you're saying, I'm trusting you with my will, my ways, and my life. I'm putting my hands in your lap. Dealing with the prosperity of the wicked means you commit. Now, I must hurry. Dealing with the prosperity of the wicked means, now here's the hard part. We've got to wait. We don't like to wait. Some of us think waiting, like I said, is standing in an amusement park line and there's nothing to do. That couldn't be anything further from the truth. As you wait for the Lord, you're obedient to the Lord, you serve the Lord, you love God, you love other people. Your influence is tremendous, but you're waiting on God for whatever this issue may be. You don't sit in an amusement park line and serve generally, you wait. And you got how many more turnstiles, how many more times that roller coaster got to go around before I can get on it? So we find in this last text, several, be still, there's one of them. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. You see that again. And forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off from those who wait on the Lord. There it is, wait. Shall inherit the earth. How many of you ever made a quick decision and you regretted it for a long time? Raise your hand. That's why if you're in sales and you have commissions, you want people to make the decision to buy on credit or whatever right then because statistics says if you're a salesman, if you're in a store, retail, car, whatever, if they leave, there's a good chance they'll never come back and buy it. So you want them to make that quick decision now on emotion, on the way the car smells. Let me tell you, you can go on Amazon right now and there's a spray bottle and you can spray it in your car. It smells like new car and that's only about $3 and it's other than 30000 and get that new car smell every week. And it's really cheap. <laughs> we must hurry. Verse 10, in a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. Without saying parochial or kind of 
shallow, we win. That should help us. We win. It says in verse 11, the meek, the meek. You know what the meek means? It means to bow down and be humble. Not my will, Lord, but thine. The greatest evangelistic tool the church of Jesus Christ has with millennials and with Generation Z is people that are humble, not narcissistic, self-filled, legalistic people that has turned off our nation to the things of God. Nobody wants to know it all, but they want somebody who's humble that loves God and loves others and willing to say, I, by the way, that's the way Jesus served, did he not? Waiting. Waiting on the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. Waiting for him. Let me ask you this. Are you trusting God? Are you? Are you looking around and just seeing, are you missing the forest for the trees, these little influences you have in your life of children, family, and friends, and you're all bothered about other stuff that are going on in our culture, but yet right in front of your eyes, you're missing what's right there. I have my Colleen's girls here. They're about the cutest things that ever existed. I know my other kids are watching this, so but they are, they're cute. and they're, All my grandkids are cute. I have to get out of this one now, right? But I got three of them there, and they come in this morning. I woke up at 5 o'clock. Guess what time they woke up? 5.15. Well, there goes my devotions. But you know what I started thinking? I love it. I'm not going to worry. I mean, I had my devotions what I could, but the point is I'm not going to waste time on stuff that doesn't matter anything in the scope of God. Not that devotions don't, but I want to tell you, let's prioritize what's important. It says, are you committed to him? Have you rolled it all over to him? Have you given God your life? Have you trusted him as your savior? Have you accepted Christ by faith and faith alone for your salvation? And are you waiting on his timing? We had a number of children and teens go off to camp this week, hit some hard preaching, praise God for that, heard things that they need to hear, no cell phones, nothing, and that God really spoke to them. I want to ask parents, moms and dads, is that you? What are you known for? By the way, ask your friends and family. You'd be surprised what they tell you. I want to be right with God, and I understand the prosperity of the wicked is not going to determine who I am. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to commit to him, and I'm going to wait for him. Let's pray together. Can we do that? Dear Holy Father,